Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to all of who you are visiting the first time. And a blessed New Year to all who are celebrating the Chinese New Year. We hope that you had a wonderful weekend and a good break uh, during this time. Uh, today we're going to continue in the series of our book of uh, Revelation. Uh, today's sermon title is A False God. Uh, the scripture text is taken from Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 till 18. So let's commit this time to God in prayer before we hear the preaching of the word. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your presence here. We want to thank you that you are the Lord whom we worship, the God who gives, who loves, who cares for us, that we can fall on our knees knowing that there is grace and compassion in your presence. And we pray that even as we look to your word, that you encourage us that you remind us of the spiritual realities, the battles we must fight, and how, Lord, we can draw from your strength and grace in this battle, dear Lord. We pray that you fill us with your spirit. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we have been looking at Revelation chapter 12, and we've been looking at the uh, enmity between uh, the church and the world, and then the book of Revelation introduces us to the character that drives the world uh, against the church, and that is the dragon, okay? So it's kind of funny, when I was preparing the message and I was thinking, man, this is the year of the dragon. I didn't plan for this, okay? <laughs> uh, but I'll be talking a lot about the dragon, but that's how it happened, okay? All right. And uh, one of the things that I've raised two weeks ago was I asked you to give careful consideration to who this dragon is, why this person has such command, such influence, and is such a formidable foe, okay? And... Um, you find that uh, why this is important, and, and, and I put a, a, a slide next to it, uh, I'll quickly introduce this. Uh, this is one book that I would encourage you to read, uh, The Way of the Dragon and the Way of the Lamb by Jermaine Gorgon and Carl Strobel. Okay? Uh, it's a very important book, as the, uh, it says here, searching for Jesus' part of power in a church that has abandoned it. Okay? So why we need to understand this is uh, simply because uh, we should realize that it is quite easy for us to be seduced by this force, by this dragon. We are not above and beyond temptation, and we should have wisdom to recognize his ways in order for us to make a stand. Uh, the enemy is far wiser and subtle than we think, and and we'll see, look, see his character in today's text. But the whole thing is that even the church can fall for his ways. Even the church can be seduced by his plans and the ideas that he uh, dishes out. Okay? And so that's why we need to ask ourselves these important questions. Why you know, he commands such uh, influence? What does he offer humanity that so many people turn to him and worship him? Okay? So I will read the scripture text, and as I read, you'll see there's a lot of references to authority, especially power, and how that power is passed down from one beast to another. And then there is these uh, references to worship. And what I'd like you to pick up also, how much of the description of the dragon has similarities with the description of the Lamb of God, okay? of how the Trinity works and how this unholy Trinity uh, works together. So the text is taken from uh, Revelation chapter 13, okay, from verse 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, and with ten crowns on its horns, and one on each, a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like that, those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. On one of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast and ask, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemous 
and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it will be given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that that image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It, was forced, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has inside calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. The number is 666. Okay. So, the one thing that we notice in this passage, all right, just a remind, reminder again, uh, the language of the book of Revelation is full of symbolism, okay? And uh, I think some of you can catch some of the Old Testament references, uh, for example, calling fire from heaven. And, and this is the miracle Elijah did, okay? And uh, how it speaks about the power of, of this beast, all right? So what's very interesting is when we capture the, the whole passage, we begin to realize how powerful the enemy is. And uh, the, the John uh, writes and uses the same terms and descriptions as used for the Lamb of God. So he was slain and he rose to new life. He had followers with his name written on their foreheads, okay? He has horns, uh, has have authority over every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and receive worldwide worship. So such is the extent of the beast, the uh, influence over the world. But where they differ is the final manifestation that the beast Okay, the dragon and, and all uh, who is evil is destined to eternal destruction, whereas the people of God is destined to eternal victory. Okay, so that's where they differ. So if you look at the whole passage, there, there are a few references that I'd like to pick up. I, I mean, and this is, uh, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to preach this, this entire passage because there's so many things happening here and I'm going to pick and choose some important themes for us to uh, lock on, okay? So just to give you an idea, uh, you find that this whole idea of the dragon and, and the idea of being wounded and healed is something that we see in the Old Testament and something we see what Jesus has done at the cross when he crushed the serpent's head. And in Isaiah 27, verse 1, it says, In that day the Lord will punish with his sword, his fierce, great, and powerful sword, Leviathan, the gliding serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent, he will slay the monster of the sea. Okay. So in the Bible, the, the sea represents chaos, uh, a godless place, and from that comes the dragon, and then from there comes this beast. And what's interesting about the description of this beast is it captures the four beasts that is described in the book of Daniel. 
And as we have gone through it, the four Bs are four empires. Uh, it is the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, uh, the Greek and the Roman Empire. Okay, so and Roman being the worst. So uh, this beast has, you know, similarities with each of the four beasts there. So he he he, he represents all of it, and. When you think of it, uh, so you do realize that these things cannot just represent an individual, but represent a political system, a nation, a worldwide uh, movement, okay, that represents evil, okay? And Satan will bestow his authority, his power and glory through this human agency, okay? And this dragon will, will blaspheme and the name of God. This, this monster, will, the beast, will blaspheme the name of the Lord. So what it means here, he, he will take claims saying that he is God. And when anyone who is not God says, I am God, it's an act of uh, uh, to blaspheme God's name. All right. If I say today I am God, then I am blaspheming against the name of God. So he rises and puts himself out as equal to God. And he successfully does it because God allows him to do it. And the people who are not aligned, uh, given to the Lamb of God, follow this beast. And he has worship from nations and has great power and glory uh, in which he operates in. But in spite of all of it, okay, he is not God. Okay, and, and that's where the interpretation of numbers come here. You know, 777 being the number of perfection, 666 cannot cut it. It's always lesser. It is not the triune God. It can never be God, okay? So we are going to encounter this beast. And what's interesting is, um, you know, in many ways, uh, John... Uh, uh, describes this beast as a parody of God. Okay, an explanation here. Parody is a humorous or satirical lim imitation of something, often with the intention of highlighting its flaws, absurdities, and contradictions. A parody of God may be used to criticize individuals or entities that claim authority or power similar to that attributed to God, but do not embody the qualities traditionally associated with divinity. divinity. So you find that this is quite a parody, okay? Uh, he really rises up, but he distorts everything that belongs to God. He has the ten horns, the seven heads, uh, you know. He has the ten crowns on his horns, very much like the Lamb of God, but he blasphemes God, okay? All right? And therefore, he himself is a parody of God. Uh, he's not God, and, and that's what we will look at. And this is something we have to understand. Why sometimes we cannot differentiate between these powers? You know, what lures us is to be careless in understanding the kind of person uh, God is and, um, and, and Satan is, all right? So the first thing we're going to look at is the whole association between authority and worship. And we see that in this text. The more power the dragon displayed, the more power he gave to the beast, and the more power the beast gave to the second beast, uh, the more worship resonated from the people, okay? So I just highlighted the, the whole movement of worship in this passage. First, the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority, and authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation he gained. And he waged war over God's holy people and conquered them. And the people said, there's no one like, a be like the beast and worship him and the dragon. And then the second beast exercised authority of the first beast on its behalf. And he performed signs and wonders and forced people to worship. So the display of power uh, led to people worshipping the beast. And this is a very old idea in scriptures, okay? It happens again and again. Uh, one of the characters we encountered during our prayer meeting uh, as we studied the book of Isaiah is the King Ahaz. And when he was uh, taken up by the Assyrian's power, 
you know, the kind of king, uh, the king, Assyrian king was and the idols they worship. He changed the worship in Jerusalem, in the temple, to match the worship in Assyria. He imported those gods. He changed the altar and he began to make the temple a place of idolatry. And he did this simply because he wanted the same kind of power. And Satan has been doing this since the very beginning, all right? Uh, we encounter him at the Garden of Eden. And what he does when he tempts Adam and Eve, he offers again power. He says to them, uh, God did not say you will die, but if you partake of this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So in that moment, okay, uh, Adam and Eve were so captured with the idea that they can be like God and the access to being like God is so simple. This very nice fruit that hung before them, delicious, looking great. Just take, eat, and you have it all. And in that moment, you know, where everything is laid out before them, they have quickly forgotten the God whom they have been walking with in the garden, the God who made all things, who supplied all things in its most richest and beautiful way, who gave them uh, dominion, you know, stewardship over everything. They just looked at that idea, you know, and caught on into it simply because they desired more power. And we see the same thing happening. Uh, Satan was even bold enough to tempt Jesus uh, he would take Jesus to the highest mountain. And he knows, uh, Satan knows the kind of influence he has over the entire world. And he tells Jesus, this is simple. You don't have to die. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to, uh, you know, work hard. I give all this to you, all these kingdoms. I'll give it into your hands. You just bow down and worship me. All right. And so you, you do realize that there is a strong connection between power and worship. Uh, people worship power. You know, people want power. People want to control their lives. They want to control circumstances. They want to be on the top. You know, they want to have their way. And, and therefore, it's so easy to worship the very things that bestow power upon us. And therefore, you find that, you know, when, when First John speaks about uh, the end times, the Antichrist that has already, uh, the spirit of Antichrist has already been working, and he says this, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever okay and that's how how, how uh, uh, John wants uh, wants us and you find that in the previous passage uh, the people uh, who are faithful are the ones who do not love the world okay who rather give up their lives than embrace a worldly system so this is how uh, the difference between God and Satan looks like okay he gives power and that power leads people to worship him but the way Jesus approached uh, this whole thing is love. Uh, John 3.16 tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And he came and he embraced humanity out of love. And he sacrificed his life at the cross. And it's through that act of love and sacrifice and forgiveness and healing a broken, a rebellious people, you know, people respond in worship out of gratefulness and love. Okay. So that, that, that is the thing. All right. That's the great difference. And I have to admit, there were times I worshipped Jesus because I was hoping I get some power. All right. You know, the mind has been shifted in a certain way because you want what you want and you're trying to get God to do what you want. Okay. But Serving God because of gratefulness and love and admiration is a, is a whole different mechanism. It, it, it just works differently. Okay, and trusting God and offering oneself to Him. So, this is the difference between the dragon and the beast, you know, and, and, and the, the third beast. And 
God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ. And as you can see in the illustration, this itself introduces us the problem. You know, why it's so easy for us to fall uh, and to be seduced by the power of the beast. So, let's look at how Jesus is introduced, okay? As much as the same language is used. But we find that the manifestation of the authority of Christ is in total contradiction. It's totally different, totally the opposite of that of the beast. So we start with Daniel 7, 13 and 14, the important passage uh, which Revelation is built on. Uh, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was like a son of man coming with clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Okay. Yes, we see here you know, how great, how powerful Jesus is. You know, and he, he was worshipped in heavens, and all dominions were given to him. But at the moment, uh, Daniel wrote this, Okay, the story was inc incomplete to him. It's only at the coming of Jesus we realize how he took the throne. At what cost he ascended into that place of power. And the best passage that describes the path of Jesus is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Okay, and it says here, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, so you can see Jesus approached the whole thing about power in a totally different way. He gave up, okay? He stripped himself of power. He did not take equality with God, something for, uh, for granted, Okay? But he humbled himself, and he made himself a man, a servant, and obedient to the point of death, just taking steps down and down and down, giving his life, pouring his life out to save a lost humanity. Okay, all right. So you can find the, the way people respond to, to Satan uh, and, and how that worship flows is, is totally different from how the heavens worship Jesus, okay? So in, in, in Satan's worship, first it was awe. Oh man, this guy can do great things. He can give great power. And then slowly are drawn into deception, you know, where he starts doing signs and wonders, uh, getting you caught up in this. But it ends up with tyranny. He's forcing his way into your lives. He's giving the mark. He's expecting you to worship him. Where else? The heavenly worship, as we saw in uh, Revelation 5, it says, And they sang a new song saying that you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. So yes, this beast had a mark that he was slain, but he was slain because he was a corrupt being wanting to steal, kill, and destroy. And through the death and resurrection of Christ, he was slain. And he rose, he was given power, you know, to do his worst, but under God's limitation, uh, under God's sovereignty, all right? That's how Satan is. But Jesus was slain because he loved, he cared. He laid down his life to save us so that we can be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, to serve him and to inherit his greatness and his glory. So you can see at the glance, yes, same titles, you know, great power, 
things happen. And that's how we are. We can see people do great things, talented, gifted, you know, people with money and resources, and we can get caught up. But as you look at the details, you begin to realize that having power is not the answer. Having love is. Being Christ-like is. And the power of God is demonstrated through a sacrificial life. So that's the difference between the lamb and the dragon king. So as I said uh, about this, this book, all right, uh, you find that once what is interesting is uh, how the church responds to Jesus. So what this book says uh, is that even the church has been seduced uh, by the, the dragon and uses its power far more than the power of the Lamb. So he puts it this way, a journey to uncover Jesus' seemingly contradictory way to power and weakness. Okay, So this is an interesting thing. Uh, it, it's an amazing book. Um, I think, I, I think I'm, many leaders read I, I, uh, Bijoy has been uh, recommending it to his leaders, and, and it has brought refreshing changes to the way we approach things. So uh, this, let me give you a, a, an excerpt of, of what this book is all about, okay? So one of the authors says this, The focus is on my ability, my creativity, and my potential. These become the pistons driving the engine of self, resulting, Jesus tells us, in the eternal laws of self. No place for weakness exists in the view of reality. More important, no place exists for God. We don't reject God outright, but we retain the God of deism, the one who did some powerful things but is generally detached from our day-to-day -day lives. So instead of growing into Him, who is our head, we ask Him to give us some magic. Instead of entering into the way of weakness, we try to use God to become something powerful. Okay. So this is interesting, and this is, this is uh, something you have to think about. And if, you, if we all are honest, uh, we, we realize that in our journey in Christianity, we all are tempted to grab power, position, giftings. I know I want to be a good speaker. I want to have the right connections. I want to know the right people. I want to have a big church. I want to have an impressive building. I want to have a nice car. And it goes on. Okay, we just want to connect with these things, to impress people, to show people that we are powerful. Okay? And in this system, uh, God becomes a servant. He provides. He is not the one whom we follow. You know, the one who's highlighted is the dragon. Okay? His way of doing things. And we run for these things. And we are so insecure when we don't have these things. So it's, it's, uh, it's like this, you know, when, when, when things don't go well in church, oh, maybe I'm not preaching well enough, I have to go do uh, some improvement in the way I look and the way I present things, or I should change my messages to speak something that can capture people, rather than preaching from the Bible faithfully. So you start to think about more superficial, more worldly ways to attract, to control, to hold people's attention rather than God. And those of you who have been following uh, what has happened over the last, especially the last 20 years, you realize that the church has caused so much damage because of such pursuits. You know, pastors have become celebrities. That's all about control, power, greatness, rather than a servant uh, heart, rather than a loving heart. And so everybody is thinking, how I will get recognized, how I will be somebody, how I will be accepted, okay? Forsaking the love and the recognition we receive freely from a God who loves us and gave himself for us. So as they write this book, and, and, and uh, even as I've been doing some reading about spiritual abuse and how the church has been controlling in many ways, uh, and... I, I, I would even encourage you to, to read church history. You can see this problem appear again and again. It's not a pleasant subject to read, okay? But this is a reality. Uh, there is the faithful church, but there is a church that always uh, was controlled uh, by evil. And one of the good examples would be is uh, Hitler, World War II. So after World War I, uh, Germany was in a bad place. Uh, um, and due to the treaties, 
they could not progress at all. So the people were suffering. There was poverty. There was much need. And then comes this person and preaches about power, making Germany great again. And then he quickly blames all the ills of Germany on a particular group of people, the Jews. And because the people were suffering and they were so caught up with the idea of becoming great and powerful again, they gave power to this person. They listened to his excuses. They changed Christianity to suit his needs. And they conformed to his image so that they may be a powerful nation. And we know the kind of destruction and evil Germany did during the Second World War. So he can bend an entire community into his shape, all right? And that's how it is. So another idea that's in, introduced in this whole search for power is narcissism, okay? Uh, and here is a quote from Chuck de Groot, okay? And he wrote, he writes, uh, this is from his book. Uh, he says, of course, we are all susceptible to narcissistic behavior. There are times when we all feel superior. We lay in bed thinking we deserve more. We compare and compete. These are general traits that might be shared by someone who is narcissistic. But narcissistic personality disorder is something far more serious, characterized by grandiosity, entitlement, a need for admiration, and a lack of empathy. Those who are diagnosably narcissistic may be talented, charming, even inspiring, but they lack, but they lack capacity for self-awareness and self-evaluation, shunning humility for defensive self-protection. Christian psychologist Diane Langberg says that narcissist, he has many gifts, but the gift of humility. All right? And this is interesting. Yes, we, we, we all not have... Uh, uh, narcissistic personality disorder, but those traits are growing and are more present within the church, within life, where the whole focus is about self, that we cannot focus on God. And, and we are unable to love others the way God would want us to love. And the person he co quotes, Diane Langberg, and I've spoken about her. Again, I would encourage you to check out her Check her out in uh, YouTube, uh, all her, her, her sermons and her teachings on counseling. And she's an amazing uh, woman who has done much and has so much wisdom to offer us in terms of these, these problems, all right? And even uh, abuse, okay? But that's the reality, okay? Why people are, are, are drawn to narcissistic leaders? Because they offer so much power. They speak so much about greatness. They are charming. They are gifted. Okay? And they paint a better life. And if you track you know, what happens in the world, it's the same pattern. Uh, even the financial crisis was driven by narcissistic people who, who, who shared an, an, a great dream of, of, uh, of pride and greed and power that led to many people suffering because of that uh, financial downfall. Okay? So likewise, uh, the church has been affected. And this is Henry Newman saying, The long painful history of the church is the history of people ever again tempted to choose power over love, control over the cross, being a leader over being led. Those who resisted this temptation to the end and thereby give us hope are the true saints. One thing is clear to me, the temptation of power is greatest when intimacy is a threat. Much Christian leadership is exercised by people who do not know how to develop healthy, intimate relationships and have opted for power and control instead. Many Christian empire builds, builders have been people unable to give and receive love. All right? So just to give you an, an idea what it what says, uh, you find that it's much more easier to control everything under power. Okay, I'm the senior pastor. I have more power than you. And then you set rules, and then you say, this person can do this, this person cannot do this, this person can do that. And you control everything based on these rules and by this hierarchy of power. And there is no personal relationship. All right. So what happens is, it is just using, controlling, doing, but no one knows each other's personal story. Okay. I, I was, I was uh, helping a person go through a very difficult time. 
and uh, uh, that person was caught up in one of these kind of churches. And that person explained to me, I was caught up so much with the idea of success and power that the church showed me that I did not pay attention to the brokenness that was I was experiencing as a person. I thought that, you know, if I just achieve that greatness, this brokenness will disappear. But that never happens. You need love from Christ to heal the brokenness from within. So as you look at the pattern in which Satan seduces the world, you know, all deception and tyranny, uh, he knows we all want to be part of something great. Okay? And as we do that, all right, the deception comes is, is when we start flaunting the rules, we start wielding power to our own purpose because we believe that we are the exception. We can do this. It doesn't matter. And after all, you know, I have to do this for the greater good. And believe me, a lot of people have thrown the greater good argument at me, even churches, even organizations, to control, to cover, you know. They say, you know, let's not talk about this. You know, people will not respect us. So for the greater good, let's bury these things. All right? And as, as the message of greater good goes, of control, of exception, then steps in uh, more and more controls. You know, the leader becomes the exception. He can do anything, however and whenever he pleases. And then eventually everything falls apart. And that's the kind of tyranny that we see in such leadership. All right? And this is how people are caught up simply starting with wanting to be something great and then up feeling control and being used and, and they say, if I do not do, then I become nobody because their whole identity and their being is tied up to this person, to this organization. So God does not want us to be in this state. So in contrast, the church is described in a place where it is bullied and, and, and tormented by this wicked power, okay? And so it was it is said in this passage, it was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world, okay? So it waged war against God's people. And then John speaks to God's people. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword they will be killed. This calls for patience, endurance, and faithfulness on the part of God's people. And what's interesting about this is it's it's telling the people not to take arms and retaliate, but rather, you know, witness as the persecuted church doing good and living for the glory of God, okay? And that's what the Christians did during the time of John. It was quite interesting how they were thrown into the arenas and persecuted. And because God's hand was on them, and because God's grace was on them, like how the stoning of Stephen is described to us, his face was like an angel because he saw Christ risen. Many more stepped up and embraced Christianity, Many more took their places because God's hand was with their people. And we see this in the previous chapter in 11 and 12. You know, God gave them power to be witnesses in spite of the dragon. Okay? They were killed, but God raised them from the dead. And, and much as the persecution is intense, God protects His church and God nourishes His church. Okay? And that's where we stand. All right? So I just want to end with this uh, thought, all right? Um, this, is, this is something important. This is an amazing verse that Jesus speaks, and you know, when he speaks about greatness and power, he always brings a little child uh, as an example of what greatness is, and he tells them, you have to be like this child. And this is one occasion where children came to be blessed by Jesus, and uh, the disciples said, hey, no kids, all right? Okay, they're too naughty or uncontrollable or whatever it is, all right? No kids. These are 
for mature audience, big people, responsible people. And Jesus had to rebuke them. And Jesus embraces children and bless them. Okay? And then he says this, uh, let the, okay, Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed their hands on them, he went on from there. And he, he makes this very strong rebuke. Uh, he said, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. All right? The little children who don't work, who don't have salaries, who just play around, who are dependent on adults. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. All right? Mm-hmm. So why this is so important? Okay, I think many of us believe the lie that we must be something powerful in order for God to use us. That you must be extremely gifted, talented, influential, etc. That if you are suffering, if you're going through hardships, there's no way God is with you. There's no way God's kingdom belongs to such as you because of the difficulty you're facing. Now, that's the biggest lie the devil can tell you. Because here, the words of Jesus, he states it clearly. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The broken, the hurting, the meek, the poor, the suffering. And here he goes to the sinners and he invites them into the kingdom of God. And people despised by society, you know, cast away, left alone. Lepers, okay, adulterers, women, and so forth. A tax collector. But Jesus opened doors for such people to come before him. So this is the, the most saddest thing that Satan has achieved. He has lied to people who are going through difficulty and telling them that you will go nowhere because you don't have power. And he'll try to seduce you, you know, to try to get some power, some money, some success in life. But that is such a wrong idea. You have received love. You have been accepted by the blood of the Lamb. The price for you have been paved, paid for by Jesus Christ. And whoever you are and how difficult your situation is, what God has offered you cannot be taken away from you. When your names are written in His book, He will preserve you and He will keep you and He will bring you home to Him. And in your brokenness, like the church, you know, being killed, being hunted down, in all of it, okay, God will empower you to do His work. And, and, and we know that for a fact. The fastest growing churches in the world are in the persecuted countries. Iran, China. At the height of persecution, the church grows. Okay. So don't give in into what Satan says about power. Don't be seduced by his lies. But rather look at the Lamb. Okay, and understand power in terms of who Jesus is, his heart, his love for his people. All right? And it is best uh, described, you know, how Jesus' self description of himself. And he says, uh, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is our God. This is the true God. The lowly and gentle Jesus. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let us pray. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you, dear Lord. We thank you, Jesus.
Praise you, Father. Church, just open your hearts to his love. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's worship the Lord as we